A pro-Western takeover in Kiev leads to a pro-Russia takeover in Crimea. As hysteria over Ukraine takes a life of its own. And that is reminiscent of claims that were made back in the 1930s. Amid warnings of an imminent return to the Cold War, we cut through the rhetoric and ask, what is Moscow's endgame? He's trying to revive Russia's influence and trying to become a player again in that region of the world. Why is Europe so cautious? This has shown that this, that Germany and, and Russia are now the two major players in, in terms of the future of Europe. And Washington so alarmed. There will be costs for any military intervention in Ukraine. Our major concern now is whether he will go beyond Crimea. I am Marwan Bishara, and this is it. This is the first time in our history people go on the street. They are demanding the modernization of the country. Anti-government protesters taking control of the country's capital. Who are the demonstrators? What do they want? They are pro-European Union. They're pro-Western. They're here to take a stand against Russian interference and to ensure that the demands of the revolution are met. CBS News, like the rest of the American media, told the American people about a people's revolution. I'm Russian Ukrainian! We believe that God will make this happen. People here are the best, loving, friendly. Come to my dad because this is the best. You have to experience it. A spontaneous uprising to rid themselves of a dictatorial kleptomaniac president who really crossed the line when he signed a deal, probably a dirty deal, with the oppressive retro Russians of the East. Instead of the forward-thinking, freedom-loving countries of the West. As for the Russians... I looked at the Putin's eyes, I saw three letters. A K, a G, and a B. <laughs> Russians are the scariest white people. It's a wonderful story. Every viewer knows who the good guys are and which team to root for. Oh, look, there's a United States diplomat handing out cookies. What could be sweeter? What could be nicer? But if you are observing from Moscow, you're watching a completely different movie. You see the three letters C, I, and A. Look how well trained the people who operated in Kiev were. As we all know, they were trained at special bases in neighboring states, in Lithuania, Poland, and Ukraine itself too. They were trained by instructors for extended periods. They were divided into dozens and hundreds. Their actions were coordinated, they had good communication systems. It was all like clockwork. Putin was born into a great nation, a superpower. He watched it collapse. The United States and its allies in Western Europe rushed into the void. Country after country, a noose growing tighter and tighter. The original Russian nation was called Kievian Rus, and it was too close to the motherland. Vladimir Putin, ex-KGB, with his closest advisors also, KJB deep inside the mega narrative decides not to stand idly by and launches his own drama. A full fledged takeover. It's real. But it's thoroughly wrapped in fiction. There are many uniforms there that are similar. You can go to a store and buy any kind of uniform. Those were local self-defense units. The Russian epic also requires clearly labeled villains. And who could be worse than... Nazis. Neo-Nazis. Anti-Semites. Those behind the latest events in Ukraine, they were following different aims. They were mainly Russophobes, anti-Semitics, groups and extremists. The war of epic words 
was on. This would be the first time this has happened in Europe since World War II. Well, the Sudetenland had a majority of Germans. A brazen act of aggression. Concern about Adolf Hitler. Sorry, that was about Saddam Hussein. Potential Adolf Hitler. Oh, sorry, that was about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Just as Adolf Hitler was. Oops, that was about Hugo Chavez. Ah, here it is. Hillary Clinton, ex-Secretary of State, probably presidential candidate in 2016, stepped up to match the Russians. Historical metaphor for historical metaphor. And that is reminiscent of claims that were made back in the 1930s when uh, Germany under uh, the Nazis uh, kept talking about how they had to protect German minorities. So here we are, stuck in old movies. The Russians have captured the airport. Yeah. Yes, real things are happening. The red alert is on. But the way we think about them, debate them, worse, the way these leaders conceive and carry out their actions seems to come straight out of a cinematic storybox. To determine what is fact and what is fiction, we dropped by the landmark Soviet-era-themed establishment in New York, known as KJB. There we are joined by Yanni Kutsanis, director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at New York University, and Vladimir Goldstein, associate professor of Slavic studies at Brown University. I began by asking why both sides are evoking the term Nazi. My feeling is, first of all, it's one of the simplest, the most basic kind of metaphors. It rings uh, something in the ears of, of many people, and uh, it hides and camouflages more than it reveals the truth. And I would say that there was a lot of mistakes uh, being made by State Department. And it's much easier rather than sort of, uh, looking backward and seeing what's, what, what's, what, what's happening just to call it Nazis. The same thing can be applied. There were a lot of mistakes done by Putin. It's much easier rather than dealing with it to call this Nazis. It makes the entire situation toxic for everybody. There are certain things we cannot talk about as a result. This makes it almost impossible to have an intelligent conversation. Intelligent conversation in geopolitics, in diplomacy, or an intelligent conversation in the press. When it comes to Putin, when it, we got down to that Friday agreement and then the Saturday departure of Yanukovych, um, the problem was that he, Putin himself had been so invested in one person, in one Ukrainian leader, uh, that he had basically lost the geopolitical game at that moment. And he was surprised, actually, I think. He's trying to revive Russia's influence and trying to become a player again in that region of the world and in geopolitics. Does that also play, on the other hand, that uh, as soon as uh, Putin, let's say, called West Bluff on the Ukraine and put his hand in Crimea, then he was suddenly the new Hitler. Calling Russians Nazis, a country which, you know, lost so many millions of people, it, it will have a very bad effect. If you visit Russia and you speak to someone of our generation, everyone has a grandfather who died, almost without exception. And the other, the other expression that we hear so much of nowadays is the Cold War. Except we don't have any Reds left. There are no Reds even in Russia to speak of, not really. So where's that coming from then, Yanni? Um, I think it's coming from um, an American desire in this case to paint the world in a bipolar way. Fr freedom lovers in Kiev and Nazi-like attitude in Moscow? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had a friend who once observed that Russia was the first country to lose Cold War and the United States was the second. <laughs> that is, the United States sort of, you know, for some reason it's lost its uh, tremendous moral potential, tremendous moral authority. But are they buying into their own rhetoric, Yanni? Uh, I think some people are and some people aren't the Obama administration does have a clear sense of the difference between rhetoric and action. So if you look at how they've been trying to deal with the Ukrainian situation, for the most part, in the short term, tactically, the American government has actually been very moderate. I think uh, Russia is totally different uh, kettle of fish than uh, Soviet Union. If you look at their military, it's very weak. Economy is very weak. So then let's talk about the reality of it, Yanni. It's, it's, it's their backyard. And they can make the case that historically, uh, this is what they've always been connected with. You know, Ukraine is the brotherly people, right? If, or from the point of view of some others, it's the subordinate people. Um, now, up until a point, this could work and Russia would use whatever economic tools it had. And its main economic tools are certain natural resources, and that's it. The problem is that you can only use them so far, and it's a blunt instrument. It's not hegemonic. You can threaten to cut off oil. You can threaten to cut off gas. 
Uh, but this is a short-term thing. It's going to be made up for on the world markets down the road. So is it in the short term, they might say we're going to threaten Ukraine as they did twice in the past, with cutting off or reducing oil or with raising prices. But in the long term, how do you maintain a Russian influence? When Yanukovych left, that game was over. But you know, before so he left, he, he was over $15 billion, correct? In <laughs> order to personally maintain him. No, I mean, Ukraine was over $15 billion from Russia. Yes. yes. Yeah. In so order this was to again, maintain. So this was not a structural transformation or an integration, really. This was money that should be taken by the Ukrainian government and used as they saw fit, mostly for corruption, in my opinion. Right. Um, so they're saying, take this. This is hush money. Is he a populist president in that sense? He loses the geopolitical game in Kiev. Um, he uses what he has. Now his popularity goes through the roof again. Is it merely because he was put on the defensive by the changes of, in Kiev? Or is it because he's afraid that what happened in Kiev could happen in Moscow next? I think that's very, it's, it's very plausible. Nobody can say for sure, but I, I believe that that's the case. Because if you look at the beginning of the Maidan demonstrations, those demonstrations were about a corrupt government, first and foremost. The conjuncture was such that people took to the streets, finally, and said enough is enough. And this is a revolution. In the long term, he might have won locally, but hasn't he lost in the Ukraine? I don't think he lost. I, for example, read today in Washington Post that Yatsenyuk, the, the uh, Ukrainian new prime minister, all of a sudden said, we're going to have we want to have a discussion with all concerned you know, people, groups. We want to have Russian. He addressed it in Russian. So basically, uh, eventually, uh, this uh, hawks realize that Russia is a regional power, and Russia has to be considered. Uh, Ukraine will find the attraction of the EU irresistible. Um, it's, it's an irresistible economic sphere. Vladimir Yanni, thank you for joining Empire. Thank you, Bertrand. <laughs> Is Crimea lost? You know, Crimea is gone. Crimea is lost. Crimea, Crimea, Crimea is gone. What's happening in Crimea? Crimea, 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 Crimea. Why doesn't just one mainstream American network ask, why is Crimea ours to lose? If anyone lost anything, you'd have to say it was Russia. And they lost Ukraine, a country of more than 45 million people with a genuine industrial base. They built trucks and airplanes, and they've launched their own satellites. Just months ago, it had a government that was close to Russia that rejected the European Union in favor of Vladimir Putin's firm embrace. Maybe the Russian takeover is a desperate attempt to salvage something. Is it an exaggeration to say that the Americans were trying to draw Ukraine into their camp? Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland had a cell phone conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, obviously unaware that cell phones are not secure. I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess with him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. Noland and Piat discussed who should run the new government of Ukraine. I think Yats is the guy. By the way, Yats is now the acting prime minister of Ukraine. And Ukraine is now firmly in the Western camp. The American media asked for action, but not a single talking head would call for more than symbolic gestures. Even ex-Vice President Dick Cheney, who once said of himself, I was uh, honored to be uh, compared with Darth Vader. Wouldn't call for a real confrontation. We could uh, do training exercises and Poland joint exercises. We can offer military assistance in terms of equipment, training, and so forth. Cheney had been vice president when Russia invaded Georgia. He should know what actions would stop the Russians. We did take some steps. There were steps taken, but they weren't effective in terms of driving uh, Putin out. So it looks like the Russians will keep Crimea. Russia! It's the poorest part of Ukraine. It has an ethnic minority, the Muslim Tatars, who dislike the Russians intensely for things that Stalin did in the past. Yes, Crimea was selected by National Geographic as one of the top vacation destinations of 2013. And hotel prices are bound to be real bargains in 2014. But it is limited compensation for losing a much larger, richer land that was once the heart of Russia. So should the Americans be whining or celebrating?
find out why Washington cares so much, we're joined now by Emmy Knight, a historian of the Soviet Union and Russia, who's an expert on the KGB, and Ray McGovern, a former CIA officer who was responsible for the analysis of the Soviet policy in Vietnam. I began by laying down the issue of American involvement in Ukraine. It would have been naive for, for any Russian or, or the Kremlin to, to assume that the U.S. didn't have some interest, but uh, it, their role definitely has been overblown by the Russians. Well, like the Syrian revolution, it started out as a popular uprising. But once that happens, there are all kinds of people that try to take advantage of it. And, uh, you know, the successor to what used to be the covert action staff at CIA is now called the National Endowment for Democracy. They've got hundreds of millions of dollars to throw around. And there were no fewer than 65, count them, 65 projects bringing democracy into the Ukraine. So is the Ukraine then a, a center stage, a, 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 the, a, the grounds, if you will, for the sort of the old era, past era, Cold War? Uh, haggling. I don't think so. No, it's much simpler than that. Uh, the neocons and those who like to give Russia a bloody nose overreached. One regime change, too many. Uh, why they thought that they could try to sort of ease the Ukraine into, into the EC and subsequently into NATO without a strong reaction from the Russians is beyond me. I, I disagree. I don't, I, uh, I, I think you're giving the so-called neocons a little bit too much credit for mm -hmm. motivation and planning. I mean, I, I think that Maidan was a, a bona fide um, expression of popular will. But don't you think that there's at least a majority in the Western Ukraine that want to be part of the European Union? Well, that happened the day after an agreement was reached where Yanukovych would have left peaceably, okay? This is something really I haven't seen since uh, the British and the uh, CIA got rid of Mossadegh in Iran. Is that in, then, in a sense, uh, Amy, a Putin, a Russia that is in self-defense, that is in self-preservation vis-a-vis an expanding NATO and expanding West? I think when Putin <clears throat> talked about these things in his in the speech, I we can't take his words for for reality in terms of what he really thinks. He also said that, you know, the uh, Russians in Crimea were suffering because of persecution. Putin, like many people who work for the KGB, is very able to to um, uh, use sort of these buzzwords and so on and so forth. Nobody, nobody want a reunited Germany, except maybe some people in the West. Garbachev said, okay, uh, we're gonna pull our divisions out of Eastern Europe, but we'll make a deal. We're not gonna use force in Eastern Europe, and in return for which, uh, you're not gonna embarrass or take advantage of us. Now, we know that from the memoirs of various people on the scene, including Ambassador Jack Matlock. Now, there is no way that the Russians can look at this in, in any other way than seeing that we took advantage. I think that uh, Moscow would be very concerned if Ukraine tried to join NATO, but I don't think that's going to happen. So you don't buy the argument that Ukraine has the right for self-determination? Oh, sure, I buy that. Of course, of course yes. And hence, it has the right to join the European Union, if, if actually the European Union does accept it as such. Absolutely, it has the right to do that. Sure. And so, I'm, I mean, uh, eventually, uh, probably that's what will happen. What is Russia's end game in the, in the Ukraine, or at least in Crimea? Well, I think, well, the end game in, in, in Ukraine as a whole is quite different, I think, now than the end game in Crimea. One, it's easy for me to understand why the Russians went into Crimea, why they did this. And I think that from their standpoint, they can make a pretty good argument. But it is a violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity. But, but why is Crimea a national interest, an American national interest? Well, because Ukraine is of great interest to um, Europe and the United States. And Crimea was, until just a few days ago, part of Ukraine. 
I think it's in everybody's interest to keep a integrated Ukraine. How much will it be a Ukraine problem? How much is it a Washington Moscow problem? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, it's it's looking more and more like a Washington EU Moscow problem. Now, I expect that Obama, who has a personal relationship with Putin, <clears throat> will go around Kerry and all the neocons and say, "Look, let's bring the adults in." Okay. The, enough for the sophomores and the you know right to protect people. <clears throat> let's let's figure this out in a way where the Ukraine can not be a part of NATO, guaranteed, okay, and uh, where it can be uh, not seen as a threat to anybody. But can we at least agree that for the time being, those who are calling the shots on in Kiev are America's allies? Correct. I mean, Yacht's first Yacht's thing to do was come to guy. Washington. <clears throat> so. On the larger picture, so far, it's America that's winning. No, because uh, the Russians have have moved into Crimea with impunity. You seem to be suggesting that this is a decision that should be made in the corridors of Washington no, and no, in no. the Kremlin, and and the the Ukrainian people wouldn't uh, have a say in this. No, I mean, I you said... saw them in Maidan. They are they. They're not going to allow those kinds of decisions to be made for them. I'm saying the Ukraine, the EC, uh, Russia, and the US, that's what I said. The Ukrainians have to be involved. But you know, those folks that threw out the, uh, the earlier government, that was a putsch. That was not recognized by a lot of people other than the people who saw some, some advantage in that. The Russians don't recognize that. So we're in an interim period where Yats may be the prime minister for a while, that's not going to last. L listen, Yanukovych was so discredited that even, and so corrupt, I mean, he's said to have siphoned over $40 billion mm -hmm. from the Ukrainian uh, coffers mm -hmm. and, and invest, you know, put it in mm -hmm. Switzerland. Was he even, even Mr. Putin allowed that Yanukovych was not a viable leader. Sure. And he made reference yeah. to his corruption. So yeah, that's, a, that's a real reason was why he, he fell. Who's, who's gaining from all this, from this enmity between Russia and the United States? China is. China might use the same precedence. That's right. Well, that's what I'm saying. In a its own loss, area. A net loss to the United States. Kissinger was very clever in playing the Russians off against the Chinese. Now the Chinese can just sit back and watch what's going on there and profit from it. Well, Germany and China are a bit of our next segment topic. I would think that this has shown that this, that Germany and, and Russia are now the two major players in, in terms of the future of Europe. The United States has a real threat in the world. Down the road, it's China, not Russia. What's amazing to me is that we're picking a fight with the Russians. We're gonna need the Russians to help us with the Chinese down the road. Angela Merkel, the political keystone between East and West, sharing flowers and laughter, handshakes and smiles with the world's most powerful men. And when Kiev was in turmoil, Angela picked up the phone. I just had a telephone conversation with the Russian president, and we agreed that we shall do everything we can in order to avoid a further escalation of violence. Angela Merkel had Vladimir Putin's ear. East German preacher's daughter and the former KGB agent, once stationed in Dresden, shared an understanding. But when Ukrainians sought to move closer to Europe, Putin moved in to take Crimea, leaving Merkel to vow to do everything we can in order to promote the political dialogue. The German chancellor played for time. Meanwhile, Russia, playing on Merkel's reluctance to burn hard-built bridges, played for keeps. If, in addition to the measures they've already taken on Crimea, Russia were to adopt further measures of destabilization, then our relationship would be impacted by far-reaching consequences. Consequences 
meaning sanctions. Uh, sanctions. Sanctions. That's easy for the Americans to say. The EU gets a third of its gas from Russia, and the Europeans are by far the biggest foreign investors in Russia. So when the French president declares... Economic sanctions, even if they are not decided today, need to be considered. What France has to consider is the $1.7 billion contract to supply warships to Russia. And when David Cameron laments... What Russia has done is unacceptable. But London is where Russians love to stash their money. They have over $80 billion there. So what is Germany willing to do? Sanctions in the field of visa bans and asset freezes. Will they be effective? I will tell you honestly, I felt proud to find myself on a list of people sanctioned by the EU. OK, so that won't work. Measures could concern economic cooperation with Russia in various aspects. There are 6,200 German companies operating in Russia. So no one wishes to take those measures. But when Russia grabbed Crimea, Merkel sent a new signal that the relationship with Russia should get a long-term makeover. Not all of the energy that is needed needs to be imported. If the United States should decide to export a gas one from fracking, this could be a possible building stone of this energy mix. German-American relations had been damaged when it became public knowledge that the NSA had been listening to Merkel's private phone calls. But now they have a common problem with a common solution. If you look at Gazprom's revenues, something like 50% of them come from Europe. So, uh, you know, Russia needs Europe more than Europe needs Russia. It would not only change the European Union's relationship with Russia, no. This would also cause massive damage to Russia economically and politically. Angela Merkel is no stranger to imposing austerity, but as a Germany-led Europe rallies to give Russia the cold shoulder at Washington's behest, who will end up feeling the greater chill? Moscow or Berlin and Brussels? We dropped by the Goethe Institute in Washington, D.C. to speak to Steve Sabo, the executive director of the Transatlantic Academy and the author of several books on German foreign and security issues, and Miodrag Sorich, Washington, D.C. bureau chief of Germany's international broadcaster, Deutsche Welle. I began by examining the difference between Berlin and Washington in how Russia's annexation of Crimea is being perceived. Well, I don't think that we have hysteria um, in, in Germany, um, at least uh, that's uh, my opinion. Uh, it's not the first crisis that we have uh, with Russia. We had many crises in the past. This is just one more. On the German side, I mean, to compare it to the American side, they have a huge number of uh, stakeholders, the economic stakeholders, cultural stakeholders. So there's a very deep web of relationships that the U.S. does not really have with Russia. So you don't no. think Ukraine is a game changer for European-Russian relations? I, I, think, I don't think so. I hope very much that uh, Putin is someone who understands that he made maybe a mistake or that he, he went too far. If he starts to move into eastern Ukraine, uh, then I think it could be a very a serious game changer, even for the Germans. I think this would be a red line uh, for the German government if they did that. Putin's looking back at the Kosovo, he's looking at Libya, he's looking at Iraq, and he's, he's been telling the West, you're pushing up too much against us, this is our area of influence. And so if you're sitting in Berlin, you don't see it's black and white. Why is it when you sit in Washington, suddenly it looks black and white? I, don't, I think a lot of people are using it for political purposes right now. But I think President Obama is basically taking a very European view on this. We have to be careful. It's not a game changer yet. We don't want to tolerate the, the changing of borders uh, through force, but we have to use diplomacy, and he's relying on the Germans and the Europeans to take the lead. And I think he's right on this. But I Germany will not use its economic weapons, if you will, against Russia, will it? No. Um, I don't think that the majority of Germans are in favor of strong um, um, uh, sanctions against Russia. We have a complementarity of interests. They have the natural resources and the big market. We have the technology and the know-how. This has been a traditional attitude about Germans toward Russia. We can modernize them and also benefit. Uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, who lived in East Germany, and who apparently speaks Russian just as well as Putin speaks German. 
So there's a linguistic relationship as well there, huh? So he has very close relationship um, with Germany, and when he gave a speech in the Bundestag, I think it was 2001. Right. That's right. Right. Then, then he said, let's let's really have a partnership, and I think he was very disappointed that this uh, didn't work out. But I would also put in this this story about uh, you know Merkel did grow up in East Germany, so right. she so she was very she's, she grew up with a very cautious attitude, and she knew what the Stasi were all about, right. what the KGB were all about. So when Putin speaks to her in German. She feels that she's being interrogated, and that's so. Her attitude. That's on, spooky, as it yeah, were. it is. And she, you know, she knows. And she has a feeling. I think you know. She knows what the KGB was all about. Uh, but just because of that reason, she's so disappointed with of, of the U.S. and listening in to right. her mobile. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, she expected Putin to do that, but not our American friend. And for that reason, um, um, many in Germany, and this might be a, a surprise for you, do not trust America. So. Uh, Merkel, Germany, were pretty much against uh, Ukraine and Georgia joining yes, NATO. And I think it shows that they were right because you cannot provide a, a serious Article 5 defense guarantee to Ukraine because it is too close to Russia, it's too far away from the West. The fact that uh, Yatsunyuk, the acting prime minister of Ukraine, left Washington and said we're not going to become a member of NATO, I guess that must say something this about was it. A, uh, this was a, um, 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 he said this not to the Americans or to the Germans, I think uh, he said that to, to Putin. Yeah. How much is um, Germany in, in step with Europe in general what on this mean? question? Oh. Is it a reflection of a European-wide position on the Ukraine, or is Germany a bit separate? Germany is not um, a country above other countries. It's not saying Europe has to go this or that direction. We first try to find common ground, and then we decide. But I would say, I mean, there's no real serious European policy without Germany being on board because of the relationship. There is a division in Europe. The Eastern countries, the Baltic states and Poland are obviously very concerned, more concerned about what's going on in Ukraine right now than, let's say, France and Britain are as well. So, so Berlin a, is leading in Europe. Can yeah. there be an America policy towards Russia without Berlin today? No, no, no. I don't, see it. I don't see it. How could, because let's say the American policy, the policy is not going to be military, except maybe reinforcing Poland and the Baltic states, but you're not going to have a military confrontation with, with Russia. So it has to rely on sanctions. And, and the, those cannot work without Berlin. Absolutely. And Berlin or Europe, that has $400 billion of trade with Russia, is not about to boycott Russia. And why should we penalize American companies by having, imposing sanctions and then the British, the German, the French companies don't? What, what, what I think is very important right now, and this is something where Germans are kind of, if I may say so, disappointed when, it, when, when they look at what's going on here in Washington. Europe offered um, aid, um, I think it was $15 billion dollars right. in the next one or two years, right. and Obama was begging the Senate and uh, the House to, um, to uh, release, I think it's one billion, one billion in, in loans. Right. In loans. We are right. not talking about fresh money, we're talking about loans. So it's not enough to say we support you, but you have really to do something. It's yeah. not just enough to say we will do something and in the end nothing is coming. This makes a point about how this is not the Cold War because really what Correct. matters in the yes. long run is what the European Union can do in terms of, uh, of economic support for Ukraine, of transforming Ukraine through that economic support, of offering increasing ties with Ukraine, not military. So I think that's the key issue. So let's then uh, end with a, a sort of a macro look, a, a bird's eye view as it were of, of the future of Europe and Russia. Is this continent going to be more like a division of labor between Germany and Russia, partnership or tension and so on and so forth? Or is this going to be an American-Russian issue with Germany just being a wingman, as it were? I would think that this has shown that, this, that Germany and, and Russia are now the two major players in, tr in terms of the future of Europe. The U.S. has basically sort of almost turned it over to Germany in many respects. They pivoted away toward Asia and all of that. So I do, but I think what we have to think about is Putin is not Russia. And, and I think the Germans and the Europeans are thinking the long game. What comes after Putin? So I think the long-term goal is to basically modernize Russia and pull it toward the West, and you just out, outlast Putin. I think a long-haul a long view that uh, Putin will be gone, that Russia is going to be part of Europe. So is, is then Ukraine a fleeting crisis in the Russian-European relations? Or is it going to prove to be more than that? Well, I think it's a symbol of where the future is going, which is toward the West. I think that you'll see Ukraine increasingly move uh, toward the West, and I think you'll see eventually even Russia begin to move toward the West after this, this regime is, is passed. And it depends very much if the help that is now coming 
from the West, the support that's, that's coming to the West. It's really substantial. That's the reason why I'm saying that really America has now to beef up its, its support for Ukraine. How important is this? If Ukraine is going to be a success story, then you can be very sure that Moscow is going to see this and, and, and that the new politicians will be much closer um, uh, to, to you and me than, than, than Putin. <laughs> On this sober thank note, you. Steve, may I well thank you for joining Empire. Thank you. Thank you. How will Crimea impact global politics? Does the use of force and strategic posturing raise Russia's profile, or will the West recoil and treat Russia as pariah? Russia's on the wrong side of history on this. But Russia is trying to make its own history, even as it cooperated with the United States on Syria and Iran. Can the powers be in conflict over one issue and still cooperate? over others, the Obama administration was planning a turn to the east, away from Europe, because that region seemed settled forever and for good. NATO and the US had large conventional forces designed to stand nose to nose against Soviet armor. They were giving them up for smaller, more nimble operations. Now, must they rebuild their infantry and tank battalions? The events in Ukraine, are they a minor local event a regional adjustment, or do they signal a global strategic realignment? To probe deeper, we went to that famous gathering place of Russian expatriates in New York, the Russian Tea Room. Joining us there are John Mersheimer, an international relations theorist at the University of Chicago. Padma Desai, a developmental economist and Russia specialist at Columbia University. And last but not least, Jack Matlock, a former U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, author and historian. I began with the issue of Russia's exclusion from the G8. I think um, it means uh, that you are an outcast uh, and you don't belong to the West, the club of um, the big boys. Uh, the rich and, so, and famous. The rich and famous. I don't think they have much capability to hurt the Russians economically. And if they do, two things will happen. One is the Russians will retaliate, and they have all sorts of levers they can play with. But secondly, it's quite clear from the history of great power politics and from Russian history that when states feel that their core interests at stake are at stake, they're willing to bear enormous costs. So Putin dared Washington with strategic posturing and actual use of force. There, there was what no America is going to be very careful. But there was together. a sort of a miscalculation on the part of policy making in Washington, yes. in the sense that when the revolution took place in uh, Kiev uh, and uh, Yanukovych uh, yes. uh, left, um, the United States uh, did not uh, foresee that Vladimir Putin would act by seizing Crimea. But only celebrated. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, it was not uh, foreseen at all <laughs> but, 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 uh, that but, it would stop, uh, you know, Yanukovych will go and there'll be a new government in Ukraine, including Crimea. Will this also be an obstacle to cooperation among, uh, between Washington and Moscow on questions like Syria and, and the yeah. Iran and so on? To some degree, yes. Now, one can argue that in the case of Iran, which is perhaps a more important one, uh, in many respects, uh, they have good reasons to cooperate, you know, for their own safety and whatnot. They certainly don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. We've had a consensus in the foreign policy establishment that NATO expansion was a good thing, that EU expansion was a good thing, and that the Russians should understand that. What's happened is that this whole project has gone awry. All the people who are responsible for pushing NATO and the EU eastward have caused this problem. But they, of course, in typical American fashion, don't want to accept responsibility because that would say that they were responsible for this whole mess. So instead, they've decided to blame it on Putin. So what then now for NATO? If this is the post-post-Cold War era, what is it? What is it? What happens now? Well, I think what will happen with NATO is that you'll have basically the status quo uh, for the foreseeable future. What does it say also about the self-determination of, of those smaller states? Don't they have the right to choose 
what sort of relationship they want to have with whom they want to have it. We also have a right. We also have a right to determine what kind of relationship we want to have with those states. So if the Ukrainians want to join NATO, we have a right to say, no, you can't join NATO. Yes, and we're not talking of rights. We're talking about political reality. Forget about Europe and Russia for a while. China grabbed Tibet, assimilated it, right? Did anyone raise anything? Uh, the Dalai Lama fled to India. And so uh, the entire Western uh, leadership. But, but, you, but, but they were quiet. Uh, but they were quiet. But all of, but, they but, were quiet. OK, so um, uh, big powers, China grabbing Tibet. Uh, there was, uh, wasn't that a violation of international law? The United States uh, invaded Iraq. Of course, it would be better for everyone to have an international order with clear rules that everybody followed. If we're ever going to get that international order, we have got to pay attention to the real politics. When we started expanding NATO, when we broke our agreements in bombing Serbia over Kosovo, when we recognized Kosovo as independent without the approval of Serbia, against agreements in Helsinki, we were setting precedents. Now, there may have been very good reasons for this at the time. I don't think the reasons were sufficient. But we never recognized we were setting precedents that would make it impossible for any Russian leader to follow the sort of rules you're talking Blow about. Back? Is that what we're talking about? 20 years of pressuring Russia, of of, of really making it look smaller and less significant in the international arena? Exactly. We had an in-your-face approach to dealing with the Russians. And it was possible to get away with it in the 1990s because Russia was in free fall and Boris Yeltsin was in control and he was a remarkably weak leader. What happened in the new century is that Putin came along and the Russians began to recover from that free fall in the 1990s and they began to put markers down. At the same time, we began to get closer and closer to the Russians' borders. And this is what's caused the problem John, today. John, I hear a lot nowadays, and I hear it with, uh, with a cringe, uh, Cold War, with the return of Cold War, Cold War 2.0, Cold War redux. Well, I don't think that there's going to be any significant rivalry between Russia and the United States over the long term. You think this is a fleeting This is a fleeting crisis. moment. First of all, Russia is not the Soviet Union. It is not powerful enough to cause much trouble. And in fact, one could make an argument that we should welcome their invasion of Ukraine because it would weaken them further. It would be a disastrous enterprise. What is Vladimir Putin trying to recreate? I don't think he's trying, wanting to create the Soviet Union back. I mean, what he's trying to recreate is some kind of uh, trade, um, investment, union, sort of a customs union, and if Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Economic empire, if, if they want to join, we would like them to um, get in. Uh, does Washington accept this kind of a concept which Putin has? But, but, uh, but, 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 so but if that's his end game, why then, why the strategic posturing? in the Ukraine and Crimea. If this is, then he is shooting himself in the foot. Well, I mean, Crimea. <laughs> it's because of NATO expansion. If it was purely economic, as Jack said, there'd be no problem. If it was just the EU moving eastward, the Russians could accept that. It's, the Russians certainly overplayed their hand. What does it mean to say, what does it mean to say the Russians overplayed their hand? How, how could they have done this differently, more adroitly? How would you have done it if you were in Putin's shoes? On this table, John, I ask the questions. <laughs> so if Russia suffers, can it make the others suffer in return? Yeah, that's exactly the point that I was going to make, that the Russians will make the Ukrainians suffer for sure, and they can do uh, big damage to their political and economic system, but they'll also make the Europeans suffer. Uh, roughly 30% of the natural gas in Europe comes from Russia, 
There's six countries, six countries in the EU that depend for 100% of their natural gas on the Russians. The German number is up around 38%. So the Russians have real leverage. Furthermore, the Germans have a great deal of foreign investment in Russia, mainly involving v Volkswagen, BMW, and so forth and so on. So the Russians have lots of cards to play. Ambassador, what about nuclear disarmament? Is this going to continue, or is this going to be used as a pretext to stop? Uh, it, is not in, it is not encouraging to nuclear disarmament because one of the agreements that we haven't mentioned yet and probably the most important one was the agreement Russia, US, UK and Ukraine signed to return the nuclear weapons in Ukraine to Russia for destruction. Uh, and this also guaranteed the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Now that agreement it is very serious that that was broken. That worries me more than the international law in general. Uh, but, uh, and that is not going to encourage, uh, I would say, so further non-proliferation. I just want to say a word about nuclear weapons. If Ukraine had not given up its nuclear weapons and had a nuclear deterrent, the United States would not have helped to facilitate a coup in Kiev in February of this year. And the Russians, in my opinion, would not be talking about invading eastern Ukraine. The message to anyone out there who has allied with the United States is that you better have your own nuclear deterrent. If I'm South Korea and I'm Japan, you don't have a nuclear deterrent. You're depending on the American nuclear umbrella. The message that I take away from what's happened in Ukraine is I better get my own nuclear weapons. So this is disastrous for nuclear proliferation. On this, on this unfortunately depressing note, John Padma. Jack, thanks for joining Empire, and I'll be back with a more positive final thought. What does it tell you that two out of three Americans oppose intervention in Ukraine or arming the Ukrainians? The same margin by which Americans opposed intervention in Syria. While on the other hand, a similar majority supported the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq before they dragged on. Today, four out of five Americans do not support the war in Afghanistan. For me, it says first that Americans are tired of war and are generally against foreign interventions unless Washington scares the wits out of them and whips them into a frenzy. Second, Americans are more modest and less cynical than those Washington elites who embarked on tens of military interventions over the last few decades. And last, until the peaceful majority speaks out, the cynics will continue to make more noise about war. And that's the way it goes. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, etc. Until next time.